Hi, everyone. Welcome to Cosmos from Your Couch. My name is Dr. Ilana McDonald, and I work at the Dun David A. Dunlap Department for Astronomy and Astrophysics at the University of Toronto. So the topic uh, of my talk today is all about the Odyssey of the Voyagers. Uh, this is the story of two spacecraft who left the Earth in the 1970s and have traveled through our solar system and have now reached the edge of our solar system. So let's start by setting the stage. So the year is 1977. It's a very exciting time for space exploration. The first satellite had been launched into space, the Sputnik satellite, uh, 20 years prior in 1957. It had been 10 years since uh, the first person had walked on the moon in uh, 1967 via the Apollo 11 spacecraft. And the rest of the solar system was starting to be explored. So various unmanned spacecraft had visited different planets in our solar system, starting with the nearby ones. Uh, Venera, Mariner, Viking, uh, all of these spacecraft had visited um, Mars, Venus, and Mercury. So the planets within uh, our close proximity in the inner solar system. And then just recently, the Pioneer probes had flown by the largest planet in our solar system, the planet Jupiter. So it was a very exciting time for space travel and also for solar system exploration. And a very special event was about to happen. This was a good time to send some spacecraft out to the outer solar system because uh, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune were all in this nice path. They were all lined up in such a way that it would be very easy for a spacecraft to visit all of them. So, this alignment of the planets only happened about every 175 years, which means that the next window of opportunity wasn't gonna be for a little while. And so what could happen during this time was that in 1977, when a probe or a spacecraft was launched from the earth, it could visit all four outer planets and use a gravity assist to make that travel time much sh shorter. So uh, leaving the Earth and then traveling next to Jupiter, using Jupiter's gravity to give it a little bit of a boost, then using Saturn's gravity to give it a little bit of a boost, and then to visit those last two outer planets, Uranus and Neptune. And this journey would have taken about 30 years had the planets not been aligned this way. But because of this planetary alignment, this voyage could happen in just 12 years. So in 1977, this journey began. Two spacecraft were launched about a month apart or a couple of weeks apart, Voyager 2 on August 22nd of 1977 and Voyager 1 on September 5th of 1977. Now you're probably wondering why was Voyager 1 called 1 if it was launched after Voyager 2? Well. So it turns out Voyager 1 was launched in such a way that its trajectory would mean that it would arrive at the first planet that they were both going to visit, Jupiter, a little bit before Voyager 2. So even though it was launched after Voyager 2, it still got the name Voyager 1. So these two spacecraft left the surface of the Earth and started to fly away at breakneck speeds from the Earth. And at about 12 billion kilometers away, Voyager 1 took this picture on September 18th of 1977 of both the Earth and the Moon together. Now, this was the first time that this image was taken, essentially the first time that a spacecraft turned its eyes back towards the Earth and was able to take a picture of both the Earth and the Moon together. So you can see the Earth on the bottom, it's a crescent Earth meaning it was only partially lit up by the sun. And just above it and behind, you can see a crescent moon just at the top left of the image. 
just barely visible. And in fact, the moon had to be brightened in this image because the earth is so much bigger than the moon and therefore it was much, much brighter to look at than, uh, than the moon was. And even so, it's, it's a little bit hard to see that little crescent moon. So these two probes, the Voyager 1 and 2 probes, then continued on their mission, getting ready to go to their destinations, which were the four outer planets of the solar system. This is a, what the spacecraft look like as they are traveling through the solar system. You have that nice big satellite dish, which is actually about 12 feet across, um, a long antenna, which is a magnometer meant to measure magnetic fields and all sorts of other instruments all on attached to the, uh, the Voyager spacecraft. So they could do a really good job of taking all sorts of data about the different planets in our solar system. So the next step of their journey was a sojourn with the Titans. As I said before, the mission of these two probes was to visit the four outer planets of our solar system, the first time that all four planets could be visited. And so uh, the first stop on their journey was the largest planet in our solar system, the planet Jupiter. Now, I should say that the, uh, this, this planet Jupiter is very, very large. You could fit our own planet, the Earth, inside Jupiter about a thousand times. It's a huge planet. And it's what we call a gas giant, which means it's mostly made up of hydrogen and helium gas, which are the two uh, most abundant and lightest elements in the universe. And so you can see uh, Voyager 2's approach towards Jupiter in this animation here. And you can see the clouds uh, moving around on its surface. So uh, this was the first time that we got to see the patterns on Jupiter's surface this close up. Now, Voyager 1 arrived at Jupiter a little bit before Voyager 2 in March of 1979, whereas Voyager 2 arrived at this planet in uh, July of 1979. So uh, I just wanted to note that you see those little uh, round black circles that are uh, going across Jupiter's surface. Those are, in fact, the moons of Jupiter. And they're moving super quickly because this is a stop motion animation, essentially, of pictures of Jupiter taken over several days as, as Voyager 2 made its approach. Now, there were a lot of really cool things that the Voyager spacecraft were able to do when they got close to Jupiter. First of all, it, they were able to see these very beautiful close-up images of Jupiter's great red spot and of the storms on Jupiter's surface. So this great red spot, which you can see on the image uh, on the right there, or sorry, yes, right, <laughs> left, right, um, is uh, an image of the great red spot of Jupiter. And this is in fact a huge hurricane that is on the surface of Jupiter and has lasted for hundreds of years and probably will last for hundreds of years more. And at the time that Voyager 1 and 2 visited this great red spot, you could probably fit our entire planet Earth inside this giant storm about two or three times. It was that big. And looking up close at the surface of Jupiter, you could see all these interesting cloud patterns, all of these storms, and uh, it was beautiful images like this that the Voyager probes were able to return. Another discovery that uh, the Voyager probes made was that Jupiter actually had rings. So here is an image from uh, Voyager 1, I believe, of the rings of Jupiter. So you can see that curve is the uh, surface of the planet. And then those sort of faint reddish lines off to the side here, those are the um, rings of Jupiter. And so before this, we thought that Jupiter didn't have rings. We thought that the only planet in the solar system that had rings uh, of any sort of magnitude was uh, Saturn. Um, but through the uh, discoveries of Voyager 1 and 2, we were able to see that all four of these giant planets in our solar system did have some sort of ring system. 
Now, we also discovered a lot of interesting things about the moons of Jupiter. And I could talk all day about all the different moons and all the cool close-up pictures that the Voyager spacecraft were able to take. Um, but I wanted to focus on my favorite moon of Jupiter, which is the moon Io. And it was certainly one of the most uh, interesting and surprising discoveries that the Voyager spacecraft made. So when getting these very close up images of the moon Io, what uh, the Voyager probes uh, were able to image was that this moon uh, was, did not have craters on its surface and it had a very fresh brand new surface. And that's because it had a surface that was covered in volcanoes. In fact, over 400 active volcanoes on the surface of, of Io at any one time. And so in the image you see here, you can in fact see one of the plumes going several kilometers into the sky uh, from one of these crazy volcanoes. And uh, it's, it's going straight into space, spewing material from Io's interiors out into uh, its orbit. And um, this surface that you see of, of Io, this sort of um, orangey, reddish, yellowish surface, the color is all due to residue from those volcanic eruptions. So um, the surface is constantly getting reformed uh, by this spewing out of various sulfur compounds from those volcanic eruptions. So this is something that, you know, no one had ever seen before when we looked at the moon of uh, this moon Io. And uh, it was certainly a very, very surprising discovery. Um, and uh, we now know, having discovered much more of the solar system, that this uh, moon of Jupiter is in fact the most volcanically active body in the entire solar system. So the next step on the uh, journey of Voyager 1 and Voyager 2 was arguably the most beautiful planet in our solar system after the Earth, of course, uh, the planet Saturn. So here you can see uh, the image uh, that uh, either Voyager 1 or Voyager 2 took of the planet Saturn uh, as it orbited around this, this very large planet, which is not quite as large as Jupiter, but you could still fit our Earth in it about 600 times. So, you know, still, still pretty big. And um, both of these probes arrived there about six months apart. Uh, Voyager 1 arriving in November of 1980 and Voyager 2 arriving in August of 1981. And uh, so both of these, um, these, uh, these probes took marvelous images of the planet Saturn. And some of the highlights included uh, getting some very detailed images of those rings. So um, the, uh, the structure of the rings hadn't been explored very much prior to this. And so uh, the Voyager probes were able to uh, ascertain the composition of the rings. So, knowing that different parts of the rings were made up of different types of elements. And they were also able to see how the moons of Saturn uh, helped shape the rings. So they were able to look at these tiny moons that were going around Saturn within the rings that would help uh, cause these grooves and these distortions in the rings. So uh, that was a really cool thing. Uh, these probes were also able to uh, help us determine what the composition of Saturn was. So looking very closely at Saturn's surface, um, they were able to tell that the, uh, the surface was mostly made up of hydrogen gas with a very smaller, a much smaller fraction of this helium gas, which told us that, you know, this was a little bit different from the other large planets in our solar system, which was kind of interesting. And it also meant that Saturn's density was very, very low. Uh, so one thing that uh, I always like to say is that if uh, you took Saturn and you put it in a giant, giant bathtub, Saturn is um, so not dense that it would actually be able to float on a big tub of water. And of course, um, the Voyager probes, as well as looking at the planet itself, were able to get a much closer look at Saturn's moons. Now, one moon that I'd like to highlight in particular is Saturn's moon Titan. It's the largest of Saturn's moons. And in fact, it's the second largest moon in the entire solar system. So very big. 
And what's special about Titan is that it has a very, very thick atmosphere. And uh, this was discovered by uh, Pioneer 11, which was uh, a spacecraft that had visited uh, Saturn prior to the Voyager probes. Um, and the, uh, the surface, we weren't sure if we'd be able to see it or not. So what the Voyager 1 and 2 probes ascertained was that this atmosphere was so thick that it was uh, too hazy for uh, visible light to pass through. So the instruments on the Voyager probes weren't good enough to actually see what was on the surface of this moon. But based on the composition of the atmosphere and based on you know, how uh, dense they thought this atmosphere should be, they speculated that on the surface of this, um, this uh, moon, there should actually be lakes of liquid hydrocarbons. And hydrocarbons are things like methane and ethane. And so uh, just here's another image of that very thick atmosphere as seen by the um, Voyager probes. And here is a much more recent image of this moon. So much later in 2005, a uh, spacecraft called Cassini was able to go right up close to Saturn and spend a lot of time going around and around and taking pictures of Saturn and its moons. And it had uh, an infrared detector that was able to actually map out the surface of uh, Saturn, or sorry, of Titan through that thick atmosphere. And what you can see here is there are in fact these dark splotches on the surface of Titan, which we we're later able to figure out were lakes of liquid methane and ethane. So this uh, idea that the scientists who are running Voyager 1 and 2 had that, you know, Titan had these lakes on its surface were actually true. So uh, Titan is in fact the only other body in the entire solar system besides the Earth that has lakes of liquid something on its surface. Although on Earth it's liquid water and on Titan it's liquid uh, methane. So uh, a little bit different, but uh, still pretty cool. Now, after this point, it was uh, necessary for Voyager 1 to continue on a path that would take it outside of the solar system. So uh, Voyager 1 uh, took all of those really nice close-up images of Titan that we were able to see, those ones that you can see right there. And its path had to be in such a way that after taking those close images, it wouldn't be able to continue on to the rest of the planets in our solar system. Um, however, Voyager 2, um, its path was able to be modified so that it could go to the last two planets in our solar system. And this wasn't part of the original mission, but you know, they were there, they could do it, why not continue on? So Uranus uh, was visited by Voyager 2 in uh, January 24th of, of 1986. So this planet is the um, seventh planet from the sun. And it's uh, about 20 times farther from the sun than the earth is. So at this point, we're getting very, very, very far from our, our home planet. So it's getting pretty far away. And uh, when Voyager 2 was able to go visit uh, Uranus, it was able to get a very nice close up look at its surface, which is this nice, very smooth blue, uh, blue gas and uh, able to study various aspects of it. So it was able to study the rings of Uranus, um, which compared to the rings of Saturn were fairly thin, but we, we sort of had uh, an idea of their existence before that. Um, and also able to discover 11 new moons of Uranus. So here are some of those moons. Uh, they're mostly just these rocky cratered bodies, um, though uh, some of them, uh, for example, Miranda, the sort of smallish one over here, has some very interesting cracks in its surface that um, you know, might, might point to some crazy past where lots of weird seismic activity was happening. The next planet on Voyager's two, uh, Voyager 2's uh, journey was Neptune, uh, the very last planet in the solar system and 
uh, retroactively, once Neptune had been visited, it became the last planet in our solar system uh, to have been visited by any sort of man-made object. And so uh, Voyager 2 made its flyby in August, uh, on August 25th of 1989. And there were a few interesting features of this uh, planet that were discovered. So for example, uh, there was this uh, great dark spot that was discovered, sort of analogous to uh, Jupiter's great red spot, um, but not as long lasting. And you can see the great dark spot sort of right in the center of, of Neptune uh, in the image there. Um, and uh, it might be a storm, it might have been a sort of storm system, something like the great red spot on Jupiter. It could also have been a break in the clouds uh, where there wasn't any weather going on, um, or you know, perhaps even where a, a, some sort of meteor impacted the surface of the planet and spread the clouds apart. Um, this uh, feature, though, when looked at later by various telescopes, uh, has changed and disappeared. And um, so it wasn't a long lasting feature. Um, there were also several new moons of, of Neptune that were discovered, and uh, Voyager 2 made a very close and very detailed flyby of Neptune's moon, Triton. Now, this moon, Triton, is uh, kind of special because it actually orbits in the opposite direction from everything else in the solar system. So everything, if you look down at the North Pole, sort of orbits in a counterclockwise direction. And this, uh, this one moon of all the moons in the solar system is going in the opposite direction. It's going in a clockwise direction. So uh, because of that, and because its composition is very similar to uh, that of Pluto, for example, we think that Triton might have once been a dwarf planet that just got a little bit too close to Neptune and started orbiting around this planet, got captured by its gravity. And you can see that it's got a lot of really interesting uh, surface features. Uh, it's, it's mostly made of ice and uh, lots of cool rocky kind of features. Um, the uh, rings of Neptune were also discovered. So just like Jupiter was, we found out that Jupiter had rings. It turned out that Neptune also had rings. Um, here's a, an image sort of seen, uh, you can see those rings backlit by the sun. And, um, and yeah, so, this was the last planet in our solar system to be visited. And after that, Voyager 2 just continued off out into space. So now we come to part four of our journey beyond the solar system. So the last thing that Voyager 1 did before it turned off its cameras forever was to turn back and to take a family portrait of our solar system. So. Uh, you can see all of the planets in our solar system were imaged here. You can see uh, Jupiter, the Earth, Venus, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. Uh, Mercury is in there, but it's a little bit hard to see. And so this was the first time that all of the um, planets in our solar system were photographed at once, which was very, very exciting. Um, so this image was taken on uh, Valentine's Day of 1990. And uh, it was taken at a distance of about 6 billion kilometers. And the picture of the Earth uh, was later titled uh, The Pale Blue Dot by uh, author and scientist uh, Carl Sagan. And so you can just barely see it in this image. Um, it's right there in that little circle. So it's a little tiny blue dot. And in fact, in this image, it's less than the size of a pixel on the camera that was attached to Voyager 1. So everyone you ever knew, all of humanity exists on that little tiny pale blue dot. And uh, Carl Sagan, in fact, became so inspired by this that he wrote uh, all about the pale blue dot in an entire book. Um, but this is one passage that I always like to um, I like to read uh, just because it really puts things into perspective. So uh, Carl Sagan said, look again at that dot. That's here, that's home, that's us. On it, everyone you love, everyone you know, everyone you ever heard of, every human being who ever was lived out their lives. 
the aggregate of our joy and suffering, thousands of confident religions, ideologies, and economic doctrines, every hunter and forager, every hero and coward, every creator and destroyer of civilization, every king and peasant, every young couple in love, every mother and father, hopeful child, inventor and explorer, every teacher of morals, every corrupt politician, every superstar, every supreme leader, every saint and sister sinner in the history of our species lived there on a moat of dust suspended in a sunbeam. So I think that's absolutely beautiful and it really encapsulates you know you think of all these huge problems that we have in our lives but when you look back at the earth when you have this distant cosmic perspective it really puts into perspective you know how meaningless and how silly all of our little problems on earth are so it's uh it's kind of a nice nice perspective to have now that was the last picture that voyager one ever took but both voyager one and two have continued on past the solar system now. So in 2012 uh, for Voyager 1 and in 2018 for Voyager 2, they both, both of these spacecraft actually reached the edge of our solar system. So what we just define as the edge of our solar system is sort of illustrated here. You can see we have all of the planets going around the sun. Um, and then you have this bubble, which we call the uh, the termination shock, and then you have the heliopause, the heliosheath, all of these words, the heliosphere. Um, what this basically means is that the sun, this star, is giving off all of this uh, radiation and also a whole bunch of uh, particles, which we call the solar wind. And these are going out into space in all directions. But every other star in our galaxy is also giving off a whole bunch of, of these particles, which we call cosmic rays. And the heliosphere is basically that point where the cosmic rays coming from the galaxy and the solar wind coming from the sun balance out. Now, Voyager 1 and Voyager 2, one of the instruments that was still working on them was uh, something that could detect these particles. And at some point, Voyager 1 noticed that it wasn't getting as many particles from the sun, and it was starting to get a whole bunch of particles from interstellar space, the space between the stars. And so both of these, these spacecraft now have reached this area, this region beyond the influence of the sun, which we can now consider to be the space between the stars, which is pretty cool. These are the first man-made objects to ever enter interstellar space, which is, I don't know, really amazing. <laughs> oh, okay, but given that I have to, you know, temper that with a little bit of reality because that actually isn't that far. So um, this is a, a diagram of the Oort cloud, which is this huge cloud of comets and other objects that are still within the gravitational influence of the sun. So even though the solar wind uh, does not reach this, this region of space, the uh, gravitational influence of the sun still extends much farther. So to give you an idea of where the Voyager probes are with reference to this huge cometary nuclei, as, it call, as it's called, this huge cloud of comets, is uh, right about there. So in fact, you know, it hasn't gone that far. Uh, and I should probably point out that the time it will take for these two probes to get to even the closest star is still tens of thousands of years. And these are the fastest moving objects that humans have ever created. So, you know, even though they've reached the edge of the solar system, they still haven't gone that far into space. We now come to part, part five of our journey, uh, which is uh, to talk about the legacy that the Voyager probes have left behind. So these, these two spacecraft are gonna continue going off into space forever and ever and ever. And they, you know, are gonna just keep going into space. Maybe sometime uh, some alien civilization will discover them in a few thousand years or maybe tens of thousands of years or hundreds of thousands of years, or maybe even future generations of humans will, you know, have forgotten about the Voyager probes and then come across them at some time in the very, very distant future. And the main part of the legacy that these, uh, these two spacecraft have left behind is the golden record that each of them carries. 
So the golden record is located, it, if this is your Voyager uh, spacecraft here, is located right there on the side of the spacecraft, just right on the exterior, easy to spot. And it is made of, of gold. It's um, covered in this gold plating. Uh, and it's meant to last for maybe up to billions of years, who knows. So this is a, what the, each side of this golden record looks like. The uh, outside plaque is what you see on the left there um, with some cool diagrams, uh, sort of arcane diagrams that we'll get to a little bit later. And on the right, you actually see the playable record, um, which contains, as it says right on it, sounds of earth. And so this record was uh, filled up with recordings of all different kinds that would um, you know, sort of give you an idea of what uh, it's like to live on the earth. So it had greetings in 55 languages. So a whole bunch of different people saying just hello, how are you? Uh, it also had sounds from the earth. So it had animals, it had like dogs and whales and uh, chimpanzees and uh, birds and all sorts of different animal sounds. And then uh, weather and geological phenomena. So the sounds of earthquakes, the sounds of thunder, the sounds of volcanoes, uh, waves crashing against the surf. So all sorts of sounds that you'd encounter in nature uh, on the earth. And then also the sound of uh, cars and, and trains and uh, boats and uh, various other things that humans use for transportation. I think there's even the sound of a rocket taking off uh, from, from the surface of the earth. And then, uh, my, my favorite part is all of the music from the earth. So everything from uh, uh, Chuck Berry to Bach to Mozart to a lot of uh, traditional pieces from around the world. Um, and then a really interesting sound of, of what it sounds like to have a human uh, brainwave, what, what that would sound like translated into sound. So all sorts of interesting noises uh, that sort of attempt to uh, encapsulate the human condition. Um, and then there were, in fact, a lot of images that were encoded onto the record itself. So uh, images such as this one, which is a uh, map of where the Earth is with relation to our galaxy. Um, there's the spectrum of light coming from the sun. So the, if you took the sun's light and you broke it up into a rainbow of colors, what that rainbow of colors would look like. Then you have various scenes of what happens on the earth. So this is a classroom full of children. And then you had uh, other images of humans activities like uh, you know, people floating around in space. So all sorts of images also encapsulating uh, the human condition. Um, now, I thought I should also explain these, these sort of interesting symbols that were on uh, the, the other side of the record. These were all symbols that were meant to be universally understood. So no matter what language you speak, you sh using a little bit of math and a little bit of smarts, you should be able to um, decode what these uh, symbols mean and figure out what's on the record. So the first thing you see here is an actual diagram of how the record is supposed to be played. All of those uh, dots and dashes or lines and dashes uh, that you see around the edge are binary code for how fast that record should be spinning in order to get the correct uh, you know, tone for the, for the sounds. Um, this next little bit here is what the sound waves uh, from the video signals should look like um, based on, you know, if you're playing the record white, this is what the first uh, signals coming off of the record should look like. Um, then you have this little symbol here, which if you're playing everything correctly, this is the first image that should appear amongst the images that were stored on the record. Um, this little bit here is basically the key for the whole thing. What it shows is the, um, the two lowest states for a hydrogen atom. So hydrogen atoms are very simple. They just have a proton, a positively charged particle with an electron spinning around it. And the electron uh, can transition, sorry, uh, from one spin to another spin. So it's spinning up and then it's spinning down. And the uh, average transition time provides the sort of clock for, or, or reference point for the rest of this record. record. So uh, the time it takes to go from one to the other uh, 
and then the uh, frequency of light that that would emit going from that that state to the other state um, basically gives you a key to understand the binary that is in the rest of the record. Uh, and then this is my very favorite piece of the entire uh, the entire record. It's a diagram that shows the location of our sun with reference to the rest of the galaxy. So the long line that goes off to the right is the distance from the sun to the center of our galaxy. And then each of these lines uh, with the um, little dashes along them represents the distance and the direction to a pulsar. So pulsars are these very rapidly rotating dense stars that emit extremely regular radio waves. And so if you know the direction and you know sort of the pulsation rate of each of these pulsars, then you can sort of triangulate backwards and you can figure out where the Earth is with re reference to the galaxy. So that's pretty cool. So it's sort of a map, which if you found this record very, very far away from the sun, you'd be able to figure out where uh, the Earth is, which is, you know, pretty cool. All right. That is about it. I, uh, all I wanted to tell you about the, uh, the Voyager uh, probes, their magical journey uh, through our solar system, starting off on the Earth, making their way to the uh, biggest planets in our solar system, and now uh, the fact that they've traveled beyond the edge of our solar system and sort of their legacy, um, what they've, they've left behind uh, for us back on Earth. So uh, I'm happy to take a few questions now. If you haven't already, you can type your questions in the chat and I'd be happy to uh, take a few now. Ooh, all right, Dr. McDonald, that was great. And we had a lot of, a lot of excitement, a lot of people, you know, really enjoying the presentation and your beautiful images, which I mean, thank you. <laughs> it's, it's beautiful. So, um, Let's go through. We have a few questions, and by all means, keep them coming in the chat um, as we as we go along. There's no cutoff here. Um, so um, Ransky asked, and I think it was in one of your early slides with one of the first pictures of Jupiter that you showed. He's asking where the monolith is in that picture of Jupiter, that beautiful <laughs> swirl. Oh, <laughs> the monolith. Uh... That, that's, so I assume you're talking about the monolith from 2001, A Space Odyssey. And if I recall, that was actually around Saturn, wasn't it? I don't know. It's, it's been Ooh. maybe a decade and a half since I last saw that movie. So I don't know exactly where the monolith would have been next to those planets, but uh, you know, it's cool. It's cool that you made that connection. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't seen that movie, so I'm uh, sorry if I missed if I missed the joke. I have to add that one to my um, to my list of of movies to see. Um, so um, Margaret asks um, about Cassini, which you referred to in the presentation. Was Cassini a dedicated probe to Saturn only? Yes, that's correct. Um, Cassini only visited Saturn. Uh, its mission was to go to Saturn, explore the rings, get a closer look at the planet, explore the moons, get some really cool close-up images of all the moons. And I, I believe that it, um, it orbited around Saturn for about a decade. So yeah, its, it's mission was simply to hang out at Saturn and tell us as much as possible about that planet and its moons. Cool, great. Uh, thank you, Margaret. I'm Margaret, one of our fabulous fans. Um, of uh, Cosmos from your couch. Thank you, Margaret. Um, ap apologies if I mispronounce any of these usernames, but a B um, Mose does. How long would it take for a spaceship to fly to Neptune from Earth using modern equipment? Cool. That's a good question. Um, it would probably still take on the order of a dozen years. Um, provided this, the planets are aligned correctly. Um, I'm thinking of uh, the New Horizons spacecraft, which was the, the most recent spacecraft to go to the outer solar system. And that uh, took about just over a decade to get from the Earth all the way out to uh, Pluto. So uh, Neptune is a little bit closer to then Pluto, but um, 
given more or less modern technology, it would take about 10 years. Oh, wow. <laughs> that blows. Long time. As that long is, as you can yeah. get a little bit of a boost from the gravity of the other planets. Wow. That's incredible. Um, so we have another question from HPR. Some of the Voyager instruments are still transmitting data. What scientific results can we still gain or learn from them? Right. Uh, yeah, so there are a few um, instruments that are still working on uh, the Voyager probes. And I'm, I, I can't remember every single one. Uh, they're the ones that take a lot less power, obviously, because now <laughs> that the Voyager probes are so far away from the sun, they barely get any uh, energy from solar radiation. And uh, all that's powering them now is like this little tiny nuclear reactor. Uh, so I believe uh, the instruments that are still working on the Voyager probes uh, are uh, things like particle detectors. So uh, things that will pick up particles coming from the sun and from uh, outer space. Oh, well, it's all outer space, but from outside of our solar system. Um, and I'm trying to remember a few of the others, but uh, things along those lines, like particle detectors is the biggest one. Uh, but things like taking pictures, uh, measuring magnetic fields, I don't think would, would work anymore. Hmm. Interesting. Thank you. Um, here's another one um, from Ransky, another fan. Thank you for joining us um, time after time. It's so great to see so many familiar faces on the stream tonight. But um, are either Voyager likely to see anything in the Kuiper Belt? Ooh, so both of these probes are actually pretty close to the edge of the Kuiper Belt. Mm. Uh, they're now about uh, 140 or so times farther from the sun than the Earth is. And uh, there is a chance that they could pass by a Kuiper Belt object that's near the outer edge of the Kuiper Belt. They're, they're much farther away from uh, the sun than Pluto is, for example. Um, so chances are that they won't be able to you know, randomly run into a Kuiper Belt object. Um, and at this point, it, it's doubtful that they'd be able to learn much about a Kuiper Belt object, mostly because uh, they they can't take pictures anymore. And most of their, their instruments that, you know, would take up a lot of energy just aren't working anymore. So uh, even if they did happen to run into a Kuiper Belt object or something in the Oort cloud, for example, uh, they, they wouldn't be able to, to give us much information about them, unfortunately. Thank you. Um, so here's another great question. Is it known how much damage the probes have um, sustained at this point? They've been up there a long time. Um, is there any is there any way to know or is that? Yeah, I mean, uh, they do occasionally send us back information and there's a, a little a ping of like, we're OK. Um, <laughs> it's a good question, though. Um, I, I know that things like cosmic rays and uh, the solar wind are very dangerous for humans, but for something like the Voyager probes, I don't think that they're that dangerous. Uh, though I did hear that Voyager 2, when it was close to Saturn, had some problems with its steering and wasn't able to turn certain ways to take certain pictures that they wanted to take, uh, but they were able to sort of fix it remotely afterwards. So I'm not sure exactly how much damage they've taken up to this point, but um, not enough that they aren't working anymore. So they're still sending us back little messages every now and then saying, I'm still here. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's great to know. Um, <laughs> so I guess this next question slightly related, but you referred to um, quote unquote, the edge. But so what's considered the edge where the solar wind isn't influential on, you know, on things like Voyager um, in the atmosphere or, or where the gravitational field from the sun gets close to, you know, negligible. Right. So the uh, solar wind, which is where we consider the sort of edge of the solar system to be, mm -hmm. uh, or at least the point at which the Voyager probes are now, uh, is, is called the heliopause. And uh, if you break down that word, it means sun stop, essentially. Uh, so oh. that's, that's the point at which you can no longer feel the influence of the solar wind because the cosmic rays coming in from the rest of the galaxy have sort of uh, reached an equilibrium point and now you're past that point. So you're, you're just feeling all of these uh, very rapidly moving particles from the rest of the galaxy. 
Um, but uh, the, uh, what was the other? Oh yeah. So, <laughs> so the, the, some people consider the edge of the solar system to actually be uh, where um, the gravitational pull of the sun balances out with the gravitational pull from all the other stars. And that would be somewhere at the edge of this big cloud of debris called the Oort cloud. And um, we believe, we aren't hundred percent sure because it's very hard to detect where the Oort cloud is, but that would probably be almost a light year away from the sun. So uh, a light year is about uh, nine trillion, no quadrillion, a lot of kilometers, <laughs> a lot of kilometers. Away. Um, <laughs> a lot, yes. Yeah, but the distance that light travels in about a year. Uh, so if you want to multiply 300,000 kilometers per second by how many seconds are in a year, that, that's the number you'll get. Um, but yeah, so um, that is the sort of gravitational edge of the solar system. But it, it's sort of hard to define where the edge of the solar system is. Do you want to mm -hmm. consider it where that heliopause is or do you want to consider it you know, beyond that point where, you know, you can't feel the gravitational pull of the sun anymore. It's, it's, it's really a matter of definition and what you prefer. I like to think right. of the edges, the heliopause, because then that means that the Voyager probes are out in interstellar space. So that's pretty cool. <laughs> that sounds so much cooler, doesn't it? <laughs> it does. <laughs> um, so a, a couple of comments about the Oort cloud, and it's come up a couple of times this evening. Will the Voyagers, one or two, will they be able to actually see or physically take any pictures of this cloud for those yeah. who, is that well, possible or... Yeah, I mean, as I said before, the cameras are no longer working on the Voyager mm -hmm. probe, so we won't be able to take any pictures. Uh, we do know that they'll pass through there. Um, mm, okay. What what they will see and what they will send back to us is unknown um, because we could get some sort of information from them uh, that we hadn't expected. Um, but there, there really won't be much that you would be able to see. And I should probably say that even if the cameras were working on the... Uh, of the Voyager probes, the objects in the Oort cloud are so far apart that likely you wouldn't be able to see, uh, you know, one object to the next object. It's just so diffuse. Um, and we can see a few objects in the Oort cloud from the Earth, but it's, it's very, very difficult. So um, I don't, I don't know that the these two probes will give us much information about the Oort cloud except for to pass through it. And then who knows, they might see something we hadn't expected. Wow. No, that's cool. So I have a very interesting question. And I, and I wonder if anyone else is wondering this too. Do they, how are they being powered or fueled? How do they, how are they still up there after all these years? That's an excellent question. Uh, so they're both still powered by uh, a little tiny nuclear reactor um, that is just giving them just enough juice to, you know, power the instruments they still have going. But we think that that a uh, nuclear reactor is probably going to run out of power within the next five or 10 years. And so after that point, we won't have any contact with the Voyager probes at all. And they'll just be floating out in space, going wherever they're going to go. And uh, we won't ever get to uh, hear anything from them again, which will be very sad. So what will just to, to build on that in my, in my own personal question, will they potentially then, could they crash back to earth eventually or when, if they fall out or will they just be there floating around forever? Yeah. So as it turns out, they're, they're going fast enough at this point and there's nothing slowing them down because there's no friction in space because uh, there's no air. <laughs> um, they're just going to keep going in the same direction until they strongly interact with another star. Um, which won't be for tens of thousands of years. So they're currently the fastest moving objects that we've ever created, uh, going at tens of kilometers per second. Uh, I'm not sure of the exact number, but definitely on that order. And so um, they're going fast enough that just based on their momentum, they can continue going on in, in space indefinitely until, as I said before, they come across you know, something very gravitationally strong like a star. Very, very, very excellent. Um, Margaret asks, um, will there be an alignment any time in the near future that might facilitate um, a similar mission, another Voyager 3 or beyond? Mm -hmm. or, um... <laughs> That's a good question. Um, so the type of alignment we saw in 1977, that alignment only happens every 176 years, something like that. So for another, what, it's been 40 years approximately. So it won't be for another, 
you know, 130 years or so that we'll get that exact alignment where we'd be able to visit all four planets. Um, but there are certainly alignments where you'd be able to get, um, you know, slingshot around Jupiter and then go off to Saturn or slingshot around, you know, Saturn and then go out to Pluto and, you know, like uh, combinations where you aren't visiting all four of the outer planets, but where you are um, at least, um, you know, able to see a few of them. And that, that gravitational assist that you get from going around a very large planet and then zipping around in a different direction that really allows you to, to speed around the solar system a little bit faster. Very cool. So we've had a couple of people ask um, this uh, similar question, but when the Voyager sends information back to Earth, do we know, or you know, back when it was still taking pictures or even now when it sporadically sends things, do we know how quickly that information gets from the Voyagers to Earth? or how long it takes to it get takes, that information. It takes a while. <laughs> oh, wow. so this, this information is traveling uh, via radio waves, which are going at the speed of light. Uh, so fastest speed there is, but our solar system's still really big. So when uh, Voyager 1 and 2 were close to Jupiter, it would have taken about maybe half an hour to uh, 40 minutes or so to get for that information to get from Jupiter to us. And then Saturn is about twice as far away, so it would have taken twice as long for that uh, information to get back to us. And then when uh, Voyager 2 was at uh, Neptune, the farthest planet, it took about four hours for the signal to get from Voyager 2 all the way back to Earth. So uh, now uh, Voyager 1 is at about 20 light hours away, which means that it takes that radio signal about 20 hours to get from Voyager 1 all the way back to us. So this, the information is traveling as quickly as it physically can, <laughs> but um, <laughs> it, uh, it still takes several hours to get across the solar system. Cool, thank you. Thank you for, for a couple of those questions. Um, so um, Akash asks, was Th that particular alignment, you know, that once in a lifetime type alignment, the drive for the mission of Voyager 1 and 2, or was it space race or just scientific curiosity or something else or? So it, it was a little bit of all of those things. Um, it was, uh, so at the time there was still, you know, a bit of a cold war going on mm -hmm. and uh, there was certainly a lot of Soviet exploration of the inner solar system that was happening. For example, uh, the Russians were the first ones to get a probe to land on Venus, the, the Venera probe. Um, and, you know, there was a lot of, you know, people outdoing each other. Um, but I think that the main drive behind it was just that sort of excitement for exploration. Like we'd started exploring uh, the solar system close to us and like, let's keep going. Let's like visit all the planets. And then there was that alignment, which was just like the perfect timing. And they wouldn't get an opportunity like that for, you know, almost two centuries. So let's do it now. Uh, so I think that was the main drive was just the timing. And then also like, you know, the excitement about exploring the solar system. Cool. That's, yeah. that's amazing. Um, somebody was asking, let me see here. Um, a couple of people were just asking from, um, what does the term um, heliopause mean? Um, you mentioned it, or maybe I'm saying it wrong. Heliopause. Yeah, I, I need to be, yeah. maybe I need to be schooled a bit as well here. Uh, but just asking what that means. Heliopause. Yeah. All right. So uh, helio is from the ancient Greek for sun, helia, uh, helios. Um, and actually, that's where the word helium com comes from. Uh, so this element, uh, which, you know, we use in our hot air balloon or not hot air balloons but we use it like those balloons and you like breathe it in and your voice goes really high um so he helio or whatever uh comes from the word sun and helium was first discovered in the sun so that's sort of where that comes from um and then pause just means uh to stop so helio pause those words together are basically just you know um uh, where the influence of the sun stops so i can go back to that slide once again. Ooh. 
actually this is probably- that's amazing yeah so two words that we kind of you know know and use regularly in the in the um english language just- yeah exactly uh so there it is again so uh that blue bubble you see in the center is sort of the influence of the sun where those that solar wind kind of ends uh the helio sheath is this kind of you know no man's zone where the two uh things uh sort of uh, balance out with each other and then uh the heliopause is just the edge of that where you start to feel it feel the influence of of particles from the rest of the galaxy cool no that's that's fabulous and i think we have one more we have one more question unless um anybody has something there uh that they need to ask dr mcdonald before we before we say good night for this evening but rid he asks so this amazing once in a lifetime alignment that we've referred to a couple of times uh, tonight. Um, how long would have this particular alignment have lasted? Would it be years or would it have been just, you know, a, a fabulous moment in time that they captured or? Right. Um, so it would have lasted for like maybe a month or two. So, or maybe even a few weeks. Um, the, the perfect alignment that they got um, for Voyager 2 to, to visit all four, um, all four planets, you know, it, it was about August of, of 1977 that they would have had to have launched it. Um, both of the, the probes could have potentially gone to all four planets, so, and they were launched a couple of weeks apart. So yeah, it, a couple of weeks to maybe like a couple of months uh, would have been that window of time. And, and the reason for this is that the planets of our outer solar system, they move a lot slower than the Earth moves around the sun. But you still have to, you know, make sure that the the Earth is in that right location and that those outer planets are in that right location for it to, to, uh, you know, actually make sense for uh, something to visit all four of those planets. It really, it really makes you. It brings new meaning to, you know, the stars or planets are aligned when we exactly. <laughs> say that kind of figure of speech in day to day life. So that's amazing. Um, yes, and a few people as well are commenting. That's such a tiny window. I agree. That's incredible. Yeah. Um, so unless we'll maybe give about 10 more seconds to see if there's something everybody else is, you know, dying to ask. Um, but uh, but in the meantime, wow, what a fabulous presentation this evening. Yeah. Um, everybody is, yes, everyone loved it. And um, <laughs> just so a much. note to everybody, if there's if you joined us late or if there's something that you missed, um, we'll have this archived on our YouTube channel. We have um, a variety of other Cosmos from Your Couch episodes that are archived here. Uh, please check them out and, um, and enjoy and, and keep on learning. We have um, another... Um, wonderful a program called A Picture in a Thousand Words, led by another one of our fabulous astronomers, um, Dr. Mubdi Rahman. Um, so stay tuned, hit subscribe, follow us on Instagram at uh, Dunlap Institute or like us on Facebook. Um, we're so happy to be here with you uh, uh, during these strange times online, but we love connecting with you and hearing your feedback. Um, and thank you, Dr. McDonald. You, you're just so fabulous at these at these presentations and, and helping us Thank learn so a lot and making it easy for us to learn. Um, so it looks like we have uh, no other uh, questions this evening. I mean, um, so I think we'll we'll say good night um, to everybody. Uh, once again, thank you so much for joining us. And we'll be here, I believe, next Tuesday night for uh, Cosmos from your couch. Um, and we hope to see some of these familiar faces and, and new faces. We love new friends as well. Um, so we hope to see you then. And until then, um, have a wonderful evening and uh, good night. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Thank you.